The rights of the labourer are first to have food, clothing, fuel, lodging, medical and spiritual comfort in return for his labour, and all these two in quantity and quality sufficient for the preservation of his life, health and vigour. If he be unable to work, unable to earn a sufficiency for his family, or unable to obtain work so as to obtain that sufficiency, in either of these cases he and his family have a right to have a sufficiency supplied out of the superfluities of those whom has secured more than they want. It cannot be believed that a million men entered into civil society in order that a couple of thousand should have all the meat and all the bread and all the good clothing and that all the rest should live upon potatoes and go covered with miserable rags. This claim of the poor man is founded in the very first principle of civil society. It cannot be believed that men can have assented to enter civil society for any purpose other than that of the benefit of the whole. The right to a basic standard of living, to housing, to medical care, and the idea that this should be paid for with progressive taxation, these are ideas which we associate with the building of the welfare state in the 1940s. The words you have just heard though come to us from the 1830s and the pen of William Cobbett. Born in Farnham in 1763, in what is now the pub bearing his name, Cobbett was a prolific political commentator and champion of the labouring classes. He also became a leading campaigner for parliamentary reform, the route, as he saw it, to alleviating poverty and addressing social injustice. Reform is the only means of preserving the institutions and the tranquility and restoring the happiness of England. It is reformation of abuses that is wanted. We want to be able to say such or such an abuse has been reformed. Such or such sinecures and unmerited pensions have been abolished. Such or such taxes have been repealed. It was abuses in the army though that started Cobbett out on his political career, publishing The Soldier's Friend in 1792. Here, writing anonymously, he drew attention to the harsh treatment and poor pay of the common soldier, something he had witnessed firsthand while serving in the army. Cobbett also objected to the corruption he observed among the officer class, leading him to attempt to launch a court-martial against several offending officers. This rebounded on him and forced Cobbett and his wife to flee first to France and then to the fledgling United States of America in 1792. While an opponent of corruption, Cobbett was no Democrat or Republican. In the United States, he wrote numerous pamphlets and articles condemning the French Revolution and denouncing Thomas Paine, the author of the radical The Rights of Man, as an unconscionable dog and traitor. Cobbett would later come to regret these attacks and looking to make amends, when he visited Paine's neglected American grave in 1819, disinterred his remains and returned them to England where he tried unsuccessfully to give the revolutionary hero the burial he deserved. Facing a serious libel case in the States, Cobbett returned to England where his attacks on Paine had won him friends in high places. William Pitt's government offered Cobbett control of a government-owned newspaper, but he refused, preferring to launch his own, the Porcupine. In October 1800, its motto was Fear God, Honour the King. The paper failed and Cobbett soon sold his stake in it and embarked on a new venture, the Political Register. The Register published almost every week between 1802 and Cobbett's death in 1835 is the most important and detailed recording of Cobbett's writings and many of his books serialized therein. Each issue started with a leading editorial in which Cobbett set out his political and social views and innovation in English journalism. Between 1804 and 1812, Cobbett also began collecting and printing parliamentary debates, a venture he sold to T.C. Hansard, creating the official record of parliamentary proceedings that remains with us to this day. Looking through the pages of the Register, by 1804 we can see a shift in Cobbett's political leanings. 
he became increasingly critical of the government, sometimes at great personal risk. It is farcical to talk about the freedom of the press unless by it we mean the right to freely express our opinions respecting the character and conduct of men in power and stating anything, no matter what, if we can prove the truth of that statement. Colbert was particularly concerned by the rising national debt and the burden of taxation. While this was largely the result of the war with revolutionary France, it was made worse, so Cobbett argued, by government corruption. The return of peace in 1815 didn't produce immediate relief either. The rapid demobilization of soldiers and sailors, cancellation of government orders for military supplies, and a poor harvest in 1816 all added to the misery, particularly for the rural poor. When I saw those whom I had known, the most neat, cheerful and happy beings on earth, and these my own countrymen too, have become the most wretched and forlorn human beings, I looked seriously into the matter. For five years, between 1821 and 1826, Cobbett travelled around southern England, publishing his observations in his book Rural Rides. Forty-five years ago, the labourers all brewed their own beer, and that now not one of them do it. That formerly they ate meat, cheese and bread, and they now live almost wholly on potatoes. The felons in the jails and hulks live better than the honest labouring people, and the latter commit thefts and robbery in order to get into the jails. The decline of traditional rural industries and crafts also reduced family incomes. The profit of the small farm received a great addition from the fruits of the labours of spinning, knitting and the like. But when flagrant impolicy had thrown all these profits into the hands of a very few persons who had converted the manufacturing labourers into slaves, the little farm itself did not afford a sufficiency of means to maintain a considerable family. The occupiers of such farms became poor, became unable to pay their rents, and in short time were driven from their healthy habitations, were huddled into sheds and holes, became mere labourers, and a large part of them, paupers. Cobbett warned that the rising levels of poverty in the countryside would eventually lead to rioting. He was proven right. In the summer of 1830, a wave of machine smashing and haystack burnings took place in a series of disturbances known as the Swing Riots. Lord Grey, the Prime Minister, promised to examine the nature of the existing distress. These words are enough to make one despair of him and his measures, just as if the distress was temporary and had now arisen from some special cause. One would as soon expect them to propose an inquiry into the cause of the dirt in London streets. The cause is this, the great, the big, bullfrog, greedy landowners grasps all. In this beautiful island, every inch of land is appropriated by the rich. No hedges, no ditches, no commons, no grassy lanes. A country divided into great farms. All the rest is bare of trees, and the wretched labourer has not a stick of wood and has no place for a pig or cow to graze or even to lie down upon. Lord Grey also promised to suppress the riots with severity and vigour. Special courts were set up and nearly 2,000 were tried. 500 were transported to Australia, 600 imprisoned, and 19 were hanged. While the government was content to blame the swing riots on a few hotheads, Cobbett saw that something bigger and more profound was happening. What are we to say of that part of Lord Grey's speech in which he speaks of instigators? Can these men look at the facts? Can they see the millions of labourers everywhere rising up? Why are they so reluctant to believe this? Because the labourers are the millions. And because, if the millions be bent upon this work, who is to stop it? While not condoning the destruction of property, Cobbett went to lengths to explain the rioters' motivation. In his petition on behalf of the parishes in Hampshire, he pleaded with the king and his government to address the corruption and heavy taxation that were fueling the discontent. We humbly implore your majesty to cast an eye of pity to the misery and wretchedness 
that at this moment pervade every part of this country. Many of us have not food sufficient to satisfy our hunger. We have not the clothes to hide the nakedness of ourselves, our wives and our children, nor fuel wherewith to warm us, while at the same time our barns are filled with corn, our pastures abound with cattle, and our land yields us an abundance of wood and coal. The misery and wretchedness do not proceed from any fault on the part of Our Majesty's petitioners. Some of Our Majesty's wealthy subjects impute this prevailing depression to an overpopulation, which we positively deny, seeing there is an abundance for the lowest of Our Majesty's subjects if possessed of the ability to purchase. But Your Majesty's petitioners more reasonably and justly impute it to a misapplication of the produce of talent and industry. And this proceeds from a misrepresentation in the Commons House of Parliament. Corbett's criticism of the political establishment did not go unchallenged. Seizing upon lines in the register where he explained the rioters' actions, the government charged him with seditious libel and incitement to riot. This was not Corbett's first or last brush with the law. His description of Ireland being in a total state of abandonment led him to being fined £500 in 1804, and in June 1810, his condemnation of the flogging of a local militiaman in Ely resulted in two years' imprisonment. Cobbett's defence in the Swing Riots case was to expose the hypocrisy of the government. The very same writings, he pointed out, that were supposedly inciting riots had previously been requested by the Lord Chancellor and the Attorney General to help calm the labourers. Only reform, Cobbett concluded, could achieve this end. I had seen the cause of reform fast gaining ground, but it was not until the month of October 1830, when the chopsticks set about their work, that I really expected it to come in any reasonable time. Chopsticks was Cobbett's affectionate name for farm workers. I have often used to tell friends that no change would ever take place unless it were begun amongst the hedgers and ditchers and ploughmen and thrashers. What then? Was it not the meetings and petitions of the great towns that produced parliamentary reform? They did good, but the great and efficient cause was the movements of the chopsticks. The Reform Bill, introduced by Lord Grey's Whig government, was bitterly fought by the Tories for 15 months. When it was first rejected by the Lords, with the bishops voting 21 to 2 against, rioting took place across England. In Cobbett's Farnham, an effigy of the Bishop of Winchester was hanged at the top of the marketplace. Eventually, the Great Reform Act was passed and received royal assent in June 1832. Although this provided nothing like the votes for all men which Cobbett had campaigned for, he took the first opportunity to stand for election to the new parliament. However, just two years later, he was to be disappointed as the reformed parliament passed the Repressive Poor Law Amendment Act, also known as the New Poor Law. I was in hopes that the reformed parliament would at once have set to work to sweep away innovations. Not only did it not do this, but it set itself to work to add to them in number. And here I come to that great and terrible innovation, the Poor Law Bill, to repeal in effect those rights of the poor which had always existed for upwards of 200 years. What was the ground stated for repealing this law, for sweeping away this government, carried on by neighbours for their mutual good and happiness? Under the old poor law, most relief from extreme poverty came in the form of a payment administered by local poor law guardians. Under the proposed new poor law, these outdoor payments were to be replaced with indoor relief. In other words, a stay in the workhouse. Here, your basic needs would be met, but conditions were made deliberately harsh to discourage the undeserving or idle poor to separate man and wife completely day and night and never let them see one another, to separate the children from the parents. Are we in England or are we in hell? The new poor law was a money-saving exercise as the cost of the poor rates had risen from 2 million in 1795 
to a staggering 8 million by 1830. There were many pretenses urged, many assertions made, but the main ground was that the poor rates would soon swallow up the estates of the lords and the gentlemen, and that it, the bill, was necessary to be passed in order to save their estates. Cobbett was enraged that the government was trying to save money from the poor rates rather than by tackling corruption and reducing the cost of the government itself. It is true that the nation is burdened, even to the breaking of it down. It is true that the farmers are ruined by prices equal to the prices of 40 years ago. It is also true that a very large part of landlords are upon the point of utter ruin. But have they been ruined by the six millions, the cost of the poor rates, or by the 52 millions, the expense of the standing army in peacetime, the pensions, grants and allowances? Cobbett failed to stop the new poor law and failed to make much impact as a member of parliament. His fellow MPs shunned his calls for further reform and he died from influenza in 1835, just three years after entering the Commons. His funeral in Farnham was attended by 5,000 people, a moving testament to his popularity. I had, for a long while, wished to be in the Commons House, but never for the sake of any advantage or personal pleasure of my own. From a very early age, I imbibed the opinion that it was every man's duty to do all that lay in his power to leave his country as good as he found it. I know that my country presents a scene of wretchedness and disgrace compared with the scene that presented itself at the time I was born. I always stood firmly up in defence, not only the rights, but of the character of the common people, who, of late years, were looked upon by both the political factions and by all the hordes that live upon the taxes, as not being of the same flesh and blood with themselves. An uncomfortable truth, however, is that Cobbett, a champion of so many, also had his prejudices. There were certain groups that he too regarded as not being of the same flesh and blood as himself or the rural poor he stood up for, such as enslaved Africans. Cobbett in his early writings described Africans as a bloody-minded race, marked for servitude and subjection, and warned of violence and disorder should slaves be freed. Cobbett's prejudices came to the fore in his attacks on the abolitionist William Wilberforce. Cobbett accused Wilberforce of what Dickens later described as telescopic philanthropy, campaigning for the rights of the oppressed overseas, while in Wilberforce's case, supporting repressive measures at home. The argument that charity should begin at home was a popular argument in the pro-slavery lobby, setting up a false choice between championing the rights of the oppressed at home and overseas. It was employed by both the elite and some radicals, the latter regarding the abolitionist campaign as competition in winning the sympathies of the nation. In a letter to Wilberforce, Cobbett wrote, It was notorious that they had no such thing as moral sentiment. It was notorious that though susceptible of the vindictive feelings which you and your tribe endeavoured to fill their breasts, they were incapable of justly valuing the benefits which they derived from the care and protection of their masters. The argument that Africans were better off enslaved in the West Indies than free in Africa was another contemptible argument made by the pro-slavery lobby. Cobbett's position on slavery was complicated though, and evolved over time. As a member of parliament, he called for the decolonization of the British West Indies and boycotted sugar, coffee and rum because of the slave labour employed in the production of these goods, declaring that he held all slavery in abhorrence. Cobbett also voted for the eventual abolition of slavery in 1833 and opposed the financial compensation given to those who had purchased enslaved Africans, particularly those who he regarded as being part of the old corruption he had fought all his life. Cobbett also vilified Jews in his writings, being particularly exercised by the presence of some Jews in the banking world. This was a world he hated 
and held responsible for a good deal of the oppression of the poor. Cobbett regretted that Jewish people were free to live in Britain. He wrote approvingly of their banishment from Russia under Nicholas I and claimed that the most important obligation of Christians was to hate Jews. As such, he opposed Jewish emancipation, a measure to remove barriers to Jewish citizens sitting as MPs, being admitted to the bar or holding high office. As Professor Linda Colley writes, Cobbett's political hybridity is something we need to acknowledge and seek to explain. Cobbett stood up for the rights of many while ignoring the rights of others. He could criticize anti-Catholic prejudice and stand up for the rural poor and the Irish in one moment while complaining about the imagined influence of Jews and other aliens in the next. An explanation for this apparent contradiction, one that was entirely reconcilable in Cobbett's own mind, was, according to Professor Colley, his model for a more humane, egalitarian future. This model, Colley argues, was drawn from an imagined pre-industrial England, a land full of contented peasants that was entirely English. Cobbett may not have been able to turn the clock back to his romanticized past or banish the old corruption he spent his life fighting, but we should not think that his efforts to improve the condition of the laboring classes were in vain. Cobbett's words gave a voice to the voiceless, held the powerful to account, and helped paint a vision of the future where the rights of the people would be realized and respected, one that would inspire radicals and reformers for decades to come. What people seek is real reform, a restoration of the whole of their own rights without violating the rights of others. The rights of the people, according to Magna Carta, according to the Constitution and the ancient laws of the kingdom, are that they are to be taxed only by their own consent and that they shall yearly choose their representatives. These are the essentials, that every man who pays a tax of any sort into the hands of the tax gatherer shall, by his representative, give his consent to such a tax which he cannot do unless he vote at elections for members of parliament who impose the taxes. 